Hans Hoppe uh, t mentioned to me after my first talk that like the uh, international monetary system, my writing on the board was chaotic. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to be a little more careful. I'll try to coordinate my writing on the board, just as, as uh, go world governments claim that they can coordinate their uh, exchange rate policies. Well, there will be two aspects to my talk. The first will be, what is the likely uh, development of, of the dollar in the, in the next few years? And to understand that, we have to look back at what has occurred in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, back to the early 80s. And secondly, what should we hope for? In other words, what, we should, what, what should we desire the future of the dollar to be? Okay. Should we desire it to be something like the Keynesian dream, which uh, every once in a while crops up, this whole idea of, of a global fiat currency, or should we push for the good old-fashioned gold standard? All right, let me start with what um, has occurred with the dollar in, in the 1980s and the 1990s. And here you'll find that uh, the system has, has um, existed uh, in the current state in the last 15 years because of an obscuring of, of uh, the effects of the Fed's inflation. Okay. Um, Wall Street economists, alone among modern macroeconomists, understand that the effects of increasing the money supply are many more and, 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 many, uh, and uh, are manifold when um, you compare it to just a rise in, in the price level. In other words, most economists see as the only significant effect of an increase in the money supply a rise in general prices. But as Austrians point out that there are effects in other markets Okay? in capital markets, in foreign exchange markets, and, and that it's these effects which bring about uh, an instability in the, in the economy. But unfortunately, when inflation is not manifested in that uh, very visible rise in prices, which we did have in the late 70s, um, people tend to uh, believe that, well, there's no inflation going on and, and things are pretty much under control. Well, let me um, talk a little bit about the 1980s. In 1982, we were in the depths of an inflationary recession, sometimes called a stagflation. That summer, Mexico threatened to default on, on, on international loans. And then pretty quickly after Mexico, um, the same was true of Brazil. In order to bail out uh, Mexico, Brazil, and indirectly, the large Wall Street banks um, who were heavily exposed, the Fed began to inflate the money supply at a very rapid rate. We had a very rapid rate of inflation that continued pretty much from 1982 through 1987, with a pause in 1984. Uh, the money supply figure that I, I uh, favor, that was developed by uh, Murray Rothbard and myself, which we call the true money supply, or TMS, uh, increased from 84 through uh, 87 at about... Um, 10 per, uh, 14 percent per year, a very rapid rate. Yet, we didn't get a lot of, of price inflation. Consumers did not see the price of consumer goods skyrocketing as they had in the late 70s. So people believed Reagan when he said that, that in, President Reagan, when he said that inflation was under control. But in fact, there were other effects occurring that were to um, culminate in, in the crash of 1987. First of all, let me just mention that um, the CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index, increased at a relatively slow rate, at 2 or 3%, despite the fact that the money supply was increasing at double-digit rates. Okay, why was this? Well, there were a number of effects, uh, or a number of reasons for this. Let me just mention them. Um, for example, the, the, the price of the dollar appreciated. That is, the value of the dollar in world markets had gone up, making the dollar much more expensive. Now, if you turn that around, that meant that with one dollar, we could buy a lot more of foreign currency, and therefore a lot more of, of foreign goods. So the price of our imports stayed fairly low. They didn't increase uh, at a very rapid rate because of the appreciation of the dollar. That continued until about 1985. Uh, we also um, found that uh, there was a technological um, advance uh, in, in, in the production of food products that spread to third world countries. So the price of food products did not increase at rapid rates. Uh, 
OPEC collapse, if you recall, 1986, the price of oil plummeted from $35 a barrel down to, 30, down to $12 or so. The international tin cartel broke apart. This led to, again, or this reinforced the, the, the um, low rate of increase in commodity prices. Uh, also, um, the U.S. dollar began to be used to leak out of the country, uh, to be used in um, underground economies throughout the world. Okay. Citizens of Argentina, of Israel, of uh, Eastern European countries were beginning to use the dollar in transactions. So the demand for dollars was going up. Okay. When the demand for a, a currency goes up, um, prices stated in that currency begin to fall. People hold more money, um, they're not spending it as quickly. So Americans weren't, so, so the, the world, in the world economy, dollars were not being spent as quickly because more and more people were holding dollars throughout the world economy. They were also holding dollars in order to buy U.S. securities. Okay, um, Japanese, uh, Western Europeans were investing heavily in, 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 in U.S. government debt, and in order to do that, they needed dollars. So to make a long story short, prices of goods didn't increase very rapidly in this period. So most economists claim that, um, that the Reagan administration had been victorious over um, inflation. Some claim that that would eventually lead to a recession, but, the, but those who supported Reagan claim that uh, this was just another one of his, of his victories. But on other markets, we saw the evidence of, of inflation. Uh, for example, capital goods markets. When the, the Fed increases the money supply, the money supp the, 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 um, they do so by increasing bank reserves. Okay? Out of thin air, they create more money for banks to loan out. As banks increase the, the supply of their loans, interest rates drop. When businesses borrow this money at the lower interest rates, they begin to invest in capital goods. And that drives the price of capital goods up. Now, what are firms? Firms that are listed on the stock market are nothing but aggregates of these capital goods. So, the value of, of a firm depends on the value of the capital goods that it owns. As the prices went up, stock uh, of capital goods, stock prices began to go up. Also, remember, the price of a capital good depends on the flow of income from that capital good in the future. Okay? That flow of income is discounted by the interest rate to give you a present value for that capital good. The lower the interest rate, the higher the value of that capital good. So with low interest rates and um, a greater demand for capital goods, we began to get a stock market boom. So from 19, just give you an example, from 1982 to uh, May of 1987, we had an increase of, uh, August of 87, we had an increase of, of 214%. The Standard & Poor's Index of 400 industrial stocks, uh, in effect, tripled. So while consumers' goods prices were rising at very low rates, stock prices were tripling. Okay, that should have told people something. All right. um, we also began to get uh, effects in, in the bond market. That is, interest rates began to decline. Okay, as the banks, with their newly created credit, impinged on, on the um, credit markets, interest rates were pushed down. Uh, for example, um, the 30-day commercial paper rate fell by about uh, uh, three percent between um, March of '85 and January of 1987. Uh, corporate bonds fell from about 12 and a half percent in mid 1985 down to about um, eight percent in '87, and the prime rate tumbled by about three percent during that time. Okay, so we had we saw capital markets were being affected by by the inflation. Okay, something that most people didn't catch. Finally, um, the, the foreign exchange market also was affected by the um, increase in the money supply. Uh, the dollar from 1985 until about 19, May of 1987 lost 77% of its value against, against the, um, the German mark. Okay? In other words, it, it used to cost 31 cents in 85 to buy a German market, it now cost in 87, 55 cents. And also in the case of the yen, the dollar lost 75% of its value against the yen. Or to put it another way, the price of the yen increased by about 75%. Okay. Now part of the impetus to this inflation was that in 1985, the value of the dollar had reached a very high level, which meant that American goods were very expensive in foreign countries. And American exporters began to, to lobby hard to get special, uh, to get tariffs and, and, and other types of protection against foreign goods. In order to, 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 to divert this sort of lobbying, 
uh, the U.S. government decided to um, coordinate its policies, its foreign exchange policies, with foreign governments. That is, to push down the value of the dollar. And there was an agreement called the Plaza Agreement in which uh, the G7, um, that is a group of, of, of seven industrial nations, Italy, Canada, Great Britain, the U.S., and so on, got together and, and uh, decided upon a, a concerted effort to drive the value of the dollar down. Right. So, this was another reason for the inflation. By early 1987, however, the dollar was dropping like a, a rock. Okay? And capital flight was threatening. That is, foreign investors began to worry that their investments in the United States, in terms of their own currency, were depreciating rapidly. So once these expectations took place, uh, uh, there was a threat that panic could spread on foreign exchange markets and that the dollar would be dumped. Okay, people would begin selling the dollar off very rapidly in exchange for other goods, which would cause the depreciation to even accelerate. Uh, at which, in which case, as people were pulling their, their capital out of the United States, you'd find skyrocketing interest rates. So at that point, the Federal Reserve System stepped on the brakes and the money supply began to increase much less rapidly. Uh, then there was a few spurts in, in that spring of, of um, inflation. But then by, by the uh, summer, we actually began to get a sustained deflation of the money supply. That is, the uh, amount of currency and deposits in circulation in, in the United States actually turned negative. They actually began to decline for about three months running. Uh, by June, the bond market began to believe that the Fed was serious about the policy of, of, of restraining uh, inflation. So we began to get interest rates creeping up uh, from uh, June through um, August and then onward to October. Uh, for example, the AAA bond rate rose from about 8.5% in five months all the way up to uh, about 10 and three quarters percent. And the prime rate went from 7.5% up to about 9.25%. Now what this meant was that suddenly there was a, 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 a much higher rate of return on bonds than there was on stocks. The stock market continued to go to to um, to, to, to move upward okay, until about August. In August, the stock market began to believe that the Fed was serious about its uh, um, disinflationary policy. At that point, the stock market peaked. It then waffled, and then in early or in mid October, Secretary of State Baker began to bash the Germans for not inflating their money supply more quickly, which meant that the U.S. was really desperate now. Uh, they, they, they wanted to, to be able to, in, to uh, increase the money supply, but if they did so, they were fearful that the dollar would start dropping again. So they were pushing other nations to do so. In any case, at that point, the stock market realized that the, uh, the jig was up, that we weren't going to get uh, a lot of inflation right away, and we had a collapse. Okay, we had a collapse of the stock market. We had a Black Friday all over again. It was a Black Monday all over again. We had a big drop on Friday and then, then the, the big collapse on, on Monday. So we had a boom and a bust, uh, or rather a boom and the beginnings of a bust. We had uh, the uh, beginnings of a bust in the financial markets. And this was completely missed by mainstream economists. Uh, they immediately began calling for the Fed to add liquidity, quote unquote, to the system. Okay, to pump in new money to pump up financial markets. And uh, the Fed um, acceded to this and a recession was avoided in, in 1987. Okay? And we had some inflation in 1987 and, and 1988. But once again, um, in 1988, or at the end of 1988, the Fed began to turn deflationary again. Um, 1989, 1990, the rate of growth of the money supply at least the TMS figure was negative, and what we got was the recession of 1990-1991. Now, let, let me just uh, talk a little bit about the 90s. People have been, have been worrying from about 1991 or so, 1992, about when inflation is going to break out, right? Consumer prices have not been increasing at very high rates. And yet, the money supply has been increasing very, very, very rapidly. But uh, even last year, we, uh, and, and, and even into 1995, there's been talk of this reemergence of inflation. Okay? And, and people in the last few months finally believe that inflation might be dead. 
Well, the point is, the inflationary boom was, and we all missed it. The inflationary boom, or the uh, mainstream economists missed it. The inflationary boom of the 1990s occurred uh, from 91 through 93. Just to give you an example, the money supply uh, increased uh, at 10% per year in 1991, at uh, 12 per, uh, almost 13% per year in 92, and about uh, 7% in 1993. Very rapid rates of inflation. For various reasons, again, having to do with the good, sides of the, the good side of the economy, what's happening to the prices of various goods on the world markets, we didn't see this in, in, in the form of... Um, rapid rates of increase in the consumer price index. However, we did see a rapid decline in interest rates. Even long-term rates came down over that period. So we, uh, we, we also saw a stock market boom during that period. And we saw uh, the um, US dollar collapsing during that period. So inflation reared its head again in real estate markets, stock markets, bond markets, and so on but it was conspicuously absent from the consumer goods markets, which is what, again, um, most mainstream macroeconomists focus on. Now, in 1994, the rate of growth of the money supply was actually negative. Okay? Whether you look at M1 or, um, or TMS, which I prefer, which is a much broader measure of the money supply. It includes currency, includes demand deposits, um, it includes um, savings deposits, uh, it includes savings bonds, and a few other elements. And in 1995, the first half of 1995, um, the first six months, M1 has, has shrunk by about uh, near 1%, and um, the TMS figure has shrunk by about 4.5%. So from the perspective of Austrian economics, um, we would expect, if this policy isn't reversed, a recession, not an inflation. There might be some catching up of prices because of the rapid rate of increase of, of the money supply uh, in the early 90s. But we can expect um, recession to take hold if the Fed doesn't reverse its policy. And that's very open-ended, and I'm, I'm not trying to predict. But um, the point is that we do begin, we, we have begun to see uh, various elements of, of, of recession hitting in the auto industry and in other industries. So the future of the dollar depends, as we should have learned by now, on what the Fed is going to do. Okay? on how enthusiastically Alan Greenspan is going to support President Clinton's uh, campaign for re-election. President Clinton, or uh, as any incumbent president would, wants a monetary policy that's going to um, make sure that there is prosperity going into the election. Certainly in the last year before the election, you want a prosperous economy to be able to point to. So what's going to happen to the dollar depends on, on Alan Greenspan. Okay, it's, a, it's a Greenspan standard. Now, what should we hope for? What, what should we want? Should we uh, accede to this uh, system in which uh, the actions of a, a, a few men and women who are not accountable to Congress uh, determines the value of our money? And not just the value in terms of the price level, but what happens in all of our markets, real estate, um, bond markets, stock markets, and so on. The enormous power exercised by the Fed is the essence of, of the Fed's function. In other words, the essence of the Fed is, is to create inflation. Okay? You have to keep in mind the fact that the Fed does not fight inflation. It's absurd when they claim that, uh, well, certain governors of the Fed are inflation hawks. Okay? They, they, uh, they rapidly oppose inflation. Okay? That's nonsense. Okay, the Fed is the source of inflation in today's, uh, in, in at least the, today's American economy. Okay, the Fed and no one else can create inflation. Now, the monetarists would ask the Fed to use its to use its power wisely, prudently, to increase the money supply at relatively low rates, so that prices remain fairly stable. Even if the Fed listened to this council. Uh, that would, sti it would still not um, bring about uh, an optimal uh, or, or the, an efficient operation of our economy. Because the Fed's actions, as, as I pointed out, have effects in other markets. Okay? No matter how slowly the rate of increase in the money supply, when the Fed increases bank reserves, which then allows banks to increase their, their loans, they inevitably 
pushed, or it, it, it inevitably brings about a fall in interest rates. And that fall in interest rates stimulates businesses to invest in areas where they would not have at true free market interest rates. Interest rates that reflect, reflected people's savings preferences. So you're going to still have this sort of instability in the economy. Okay? Whether or not the, the, the monetarist um, advice is followed. And it's very unlikely that it will be followed. There'll always be a reason to depart from this rule of um, increasing the money supply at low rates. Uh, that is, uh, for example, bailing out Mexico, uh, as we did, in, uh, as, Lu, as Lou Rockwell pointed out. That, that, that results in an increase in, in the U.S. money supply. It's an emergency situation. There'll be pressure on the Fed to uh, in, in, um, engage in this sort of activity to prevent the failure of, of U.S. banks. So they would depart from the rule very naturally. We also have, have the uh, element that I, I spoke about earlier today, that of uh, exchange rates varying in ways that uh, injure some areas, some sectors of the economy, and which brings pressure to bear then on the Fed and on the government to do something about the instability of, of exchange rates. In fact, uh, since early 1995, uh, be before the, the, the value of the dollar began to firm up and appreciate, the Clinton administration used the depreciating dollar as a weapon against Japan. Okay? Not only did we not do anything about the depreciating dollar to firm up its value, but uh, it was actually welcomed by, by the Clinton administration because it made our goods cheaper. Okay? When our dollar is cheaper, our goods are cheaper. And it made foreign imports more expensive. So with the Japanese uh, economy still in a recession, uh, their, their auto industry was very sensitive to the fact that uh, the high prices of Japanese autos in the United States, because our dollars bought so little, um, caused a, a further decline in profits in, uh, for these Japanese co um, companies. Right, so, should we, so it's clear that not many people want to continue in the system that we have today. Uh, what are the alternatives? Um, there are two, two alternatives that really haven't been tried. Uh, glo global fiat currency and we might call the 100% gold standard which Professor uh, Rothbard when he was alive so, so vigorously um, propounded. Let me just say a few words about the global fiat currency. Um, as I mentioned this earlier today this, this was the, uh, the dream of John Maynard Keynes. When Exchange rates fluctuate against one another as they do now. Some countries will find that they're inflating more quickly than other countries. That is, their policies are not coordinated. And when that's the case, the values of those more inflationary currencies will be going down. Now, for some, uh, there's, there are some reasons for preferring that on the part of, of governments. That is, it helps their exports and so on. But when, when exchange rates fall too rapidly or depreciate too rapidly, it brings up the specter of, of, of capital flowing out of your country, of foreigners and your residents pulling capital out, as happened to, to Mexico in late 1994, 1995. Uh, in which case, your currency goes into free fall. The value just um, plummets. And there's, there's a, a, a self-reinforcement. That is, more people flee from, the, from, from your capital markets and your interest rates skyrocket. So to avoid this, I mean, this is really the one virtue of fluctuating exchange rates. That governments, to some extent, okay, very, within very wide limits, have their hands tied regarding how much inflation they can, they can indulge in. Because they're fearful, they're always fearful that their currencies could go into free fall. Well, the Keynesians seeing this, um, and being in inflationist to the core, uh, want to coordinate policies. That is, they want all countries to inflate at the same rate. And the way to bring that about is to have one central bank issuing some sort of paper reserves to the rest of the world. Uh, Keynes, as I mentioned this morning, called it a Bancor. He wanted the name of this world currency to be Bancor. Um, from bank, gold. Or is uh, the um, Latin for gold. And the American negotiator wanted Unita. And recently, the British magazine, The Economist, came up with the, the term Phoenix. Okay, this is the you know, fiat currency rises from its own ashes. Okay, as quickly as you can destroy, as it destroys itself. Okay, it reemerges. Um, whatever it's called, what would happen is basically that um, you would have a World Bank printing up these reserve 
currency units and then allocating them to the various um, countries, central banks of the world. And, and, and those central banks would then use them as reserves to back their own currencies. So their own currencies would then inflate on top of the paper currencies. Uh, there would be no problem of, of losing reserves from one, one country to the next. Um, all cu countries would be able to, to, to pile or pyramid their currencies on top of, of these paper currencies, which are elastic. Okay? If one country gets into, has problems, balance of payments problems, these uh, reserves can be printed up and can be lent to that country. So this would be a lender of last resort. Okay? You wouldn't have to worry about the U.S. trying to, uh, uh, courting the, uh, the um, ire of its taxpayers by bailing out Mexico. Now you would simply have uh, the bailout occur through a technical operation brought about by s some world um, bureaucracy. Now, I, I don't think we want that. Okay. Um, the Keynesian dream is bankrupt. Uh, I don't think it will ever be implemented because of national rivalries, national jealousies. Uh, the closest we've ever gotten to it, as I said, was the, um, the Bretton Woods system, and that, and that collapsed. So I'm not, I'm not worried that this, that this is our future. Uh, though, again, trends can change, ideology can change. Um, there isn't as much of a push for this right now as there was a few years ago. But what, the, what, what about the other solution? Okay, this, is, uh, this is what I would consider to be a utopian solution. But in some sense, I know this is an oxymoron, a practical utopian solution. Practical in the sense that it's within our grasp and that it will present us with a monetary system that, that uh, allows our economy to operate uh, efficiently. As efficiently as, as, as is possible in a world of uncertainty. Okay, it's not to say that entrepreneurs will not make mistakes under this monetary system. But... Um, they will be able to calculate. They will be able to calculate the, um, uh, without any um, diversion from, from artificial interference with interest rates. Uh, they'll be able to calculate their revenues and their costs. Okay. So production will be efficient in that sense. All right, let me um, just talk about how we might go back to this system. Uh, you, you have, uh, most of you probably have seen Murray Rothbard's pamphlet, um, The Case Against the Fed. Uh, there he has a plan to go back to the gold standard, but it's really only a plan to go back to uh, a classical gold standard under which there still exists uh, a fra fractional reserve banking. Okay, though it does involve the abolition of the Fed. Uh, in, early, in earlier work, The Mystery of Banking, uh, Professor Rothbard um, talked about a plan to uh, reinstitute a 100% gold standard. Uh, meaning that not only do we, do we uh, denationalize money, separate it from the state, separate it from the U.S. government, but also, in one fell swoop, get rid of the, um, the fractional reserve banking system. Okay, let's look at um, how we go about this. Right now, there is approximately 260 million ounces of gold that is owned by the Fed. It's held by the Treasury, but it's, it's owned by the Fed. Actually, most of it is not in Fort Knox. Most of it is, is actually, um, oh, I'm sorry, million ounces, not dollars. Most of it's in the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Now, if we take a definition of the money supply, that includes currency, that is the paper Fed notes that we all use, plus demand deposits, that is our checking accounts at regular commercial banks, plus other checkable deposits, that is checking accounts at savings and loans and so on, we find that there's approximately $1.134 trillion in this definition of the money supply. Now, if we were to, to continue to value gold at its old official price of $42, which is what it's on the books for now, that would give us nowhere near a value of gold that was sufficient to back up all currency and, and checkable deposits. But we don't have to be stuck with this. We don't have to feel that we're, we're tied into this, uh, this value of gold, this price of gold. Okay. It's arbitrary. Okay. If it ever meant anything in the past, the government has inflated the money supply so much that that the, this historical price of gold is, is simply irrelevant to, to today's circumstances. So the first step that um, 
uh, Murray Rothbard counsels, is to revalue this 260 million ounces so that its total value in dollar terms is exactly equal to the liabilities of, of, of the banking system and plus currency. Okay? The demand deposits and the, um, the checkable deposits are liabilities of, of the banking system. Okay? They're backed up uh, t by 10% reserves, approximately. Yeah, right. In other words, all you would do would be to divide 260 million into 1.134 trillion, and like, it would come up with approximately $4,363. Now let's avoid the transition. Let me just abstract the transition problems for a moment. It is per ounce. Um, let, let's just let's just step back for a moment. Preliminary to doing this, you would want the, to, the Fed to stop increasing the money supply. Okay, to do that. You would um, restrict the Fed from ever again purchasing any government securities. The Fed increases the money supply by by printing up reserves and, and purchasing government securities with them. Okay, basically by writing a check on itself and buying government bonds um, from from uh, bond dealers or or, or from uh, the banks. Okay. Prevent them from ever doing that again, and you would have in effect prevented. Um, them from ever creating reserves for the banking system. Now they can also they can also increase the money supply by lowering the reserve requirement. It's approximately 10 percent. That is, banks must hold about 10 percent reserves for every dollar of, of deposits. Um, which means, again, I don't want to get into the technical end of it. It means that that the banking system can, uh, for every dollar of new reserves created by the Fed, it can create 10 new dollars of checking account money. You can prevent. You can freeze the reserve requirements. And finally, the Fed can also lend money to the banks through uh, discounting, or discount operations. Uh, what you can do is you can make that unprofitable by raising the discount rate above the market rate, above the prime rate. Okay, make it a penalty rate as it, as it was originally conceived to be. In which case, you would basically freeze what we call the monetary base, the amount of, of bank reserves in the system plus the amount of currency. And you would effectively then freeze um, M1. Now, the, the Fed has um, a lot of assets, uh, the biggest um, component of which is all the government bonds that it owns, and which you and I have to pay interest on. Okay? What happens to that interest? The interest that the Fed earns on those bonds, which it has purchased by, by, by simply writing checks on itself, creating reserves out of thin air, uh, that money goes to um, fund the cushy salaries of the Fed bureaucrats um, and, 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 and uh, to... Um, to, to fund their, uh, their very plush um, plant. The rest goes to the, the U.S. Treasury. We can just cancel those bonds. Just get rid of it. Get rid of them. Okay? Just, just write them off. Okay? And we can then proceed to liquidate the Fed. Okay? That is, the Fed would then have to distribute the gold for, for the reserves that are held by the banking system and, and, and exchange, in exchange for currency. So the Fed notes would all be turned in um, for, at the rate of 1 4,363rd uh, uh, um, ounce per dollar. Okay? Uh, 400, basically 1 fourth 4,300th ounce per dollar. Then people would have, then we would have disgorged the gold. People will have gold in their hands. Okay. Um, initially, you might want the, the, uh, some agency of government to mint, to mint these coins. Okay. Um, but after that, it, certainly they can be minted by private, um, private firms. So you would have gold coins in circulation. Now, what would people do with these gold coins? Um, they could then deposit them in banks with the requirement that if they're deposited in, in, in checking accounts, well, then the banks must hold the full um, amount of gold to back up the, uh, the dollars issued. So if, if, if for every, uh, let's make this simple, for every $4,300 of banknotes, private banknotes now, Chase Manhattan, uh, First National Bank, for every $4,300 worth of banknotes, they would have to have on hand one, one ounce of gold. Okay. For every um, $4,300 worth of, of checking deposits that are deposited with them, they must hold a full ounce of gold. So you would get 100% banking. 
Now, there's, 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 there's something else that has to be uh, noted here. Um, we have a lot of savings deposits at banks, which can be withdrawn at any moment in time. Okay? They're pretty much like checking deposits, in that people can redeem their savings deposits instantaneously. Right now, their um, reserves, or the, the legal reserves for savings deposits, are zero. Okay, the banks don't hold much reserves for savings deposits. You might, you might want to um, insist that these savings deposits be transformed into certificates of deposit. That is, people can no longer instantaneously withdraw them. Uh, they must now wait 30 days or 60 days. The bank can negotiate um, for higher rates of interest for, 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 for longer periods of time. Uh, in any case, um, the bank would now then be divided into two parts. On the one hand, there would be a deposit department, which would hold 100% reserves against the liabilities, against the checking deposit money. And on the other hand, you would have a loan department. If people wanted... To, now, in the case of checking deposits, we would no longer earn interest on our checking deposits. Okay? In fact, you'd have to pay a small fee to have your gold stored in these banks. Okay? On the other hand, if you wish to earn interest, the bank would be free to offer certificates of deposit. It would be free to accept um, your deposits for periods of 30 days, 60 days, 2 years, 5 years, um, with the, the um, explicit contractual obligation that they will redeem them only at maturity. Okay? So then, based on, on, on this... Um, uh, time profile of certificates of deposit, they could make loans of longer or shorter duration. And now this would not be inflationary. In other words, if you were to, to um, purchase a certificate of deposit for, for a full year from a bank, a one-year certificate of deposit, uh, the money that you invested would no longer be ready, would no longer be accessible to you at all. Okay? The money would be transferred from your cash balance, from your money holdings, to the money holdings of, 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 of the business firm that borrowed that money. In other words, these transactions would no, no longer have an effect on the interest rate. They would not drive the interest rate down. Certificates of deposits would, would, would um, express people's true preferences for saving. So the interest rate that emerged on this credit market uh, from which you have barred the expansion through um, multiple expansion of, of, credit, of, of, of bank credit, uh, those markets would reflect uh, people's true time preferences, we call Wall Street economics their time preferences, the degree to which they're willing to postpone their present consumption. And the interest rate would then be a genuine interest rate. So you would no longer have uh, the, the cause of business cycles operating on these markets. Also, banks or, and other institutions would be, would be free to offer money market mutual funds. People who want uh, more liquid investments than certificates of deposit might wish to invest their saved funds, or a portion of their saved funds, in money market mutual funds. Uh, money market mutual funds are typically invested by the fund manager in um, short-term, high-grade corporate, uh, corporate um, debt, such as um, commercial paper, in uh, short-term government um, securities, and so on. Now, during the, 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 the chaos of the 1980s, not one money market mutual fund went bankrupt. And yet, they, they were not insured. Well, why was that? Well, it was, it was be precisely because they were not insured. Without insurance, they were very, very careful about where they were investing. Okay? They didn't take large risks for um, high returns. Um, customers didn't see the FDIC sign and therefore didn't blindly trust these institutions. Okay? They read the prospectus, and uh, they were very careful about, uh, about, about choosing money market mutual funds. Um, in the last few years, there have been one or two, or maybe even more, a handful of money market mutual funds that, um, that were unable to pay out the full uh, investments of their shareholders. But the fund managers bailed them out. In other words, they were privately bailed out by the funds themselves. A money market mutual fund does not guarantee you, by the way, uh, that, that, that uh, your principal will be paid back. Okay. In other words, unlike a bank deposit, it's not 
a right, when you buy a money market mutual fund share, you do not own a right to a fixed amount of currency. Okay, if you invest $10,000, what you own is a certain portion of the um, asset portfolio, a certain, a certain uh, proportion of, of, of the various uh, commercial paper investments and so on. So that if they lose money, then that is reflected in, in your interest return and possibly in your principal. One firm, um, Money Market Mutual Fund, uh, that was liquidated, the only one I know that, that didn't pay off the full one dollar on its shares, uh, paid off something like 94 cents, something like that. So these would be available, they'd be fairly safe, there'd be a, a sort of an intermediate between a certificate of deposit and um, an investment in a checking deposit, and they would also um, serve to transfer savings from consumers, consumer savers, to um, business firms. So we would have a thriving capital market. In other words, uh, having a 100% gold standard does not prevent us from, um, or does, does not cut off banks as, as intermediaries, as financial intermediaries. They would still operate as financial intermediaries. Okay? But they, had to, they, they, would, they would have to be sure to match their, um, the maturities of their, of their, um, uh, their assets and their liabilities. Okay? If you promise to have something available instantaneously, whenever someone writes out a check, uh, then you must ha actually have it available under this system. Now, Professor Rothbard also put forward another plan which would involve a lower price of gold, uh, and that plan was basically only to um, increase the price of gold so as to back up only Fed liabilities, the Federal Reserve System's liabilities. Basically, the currency plus reserves, the bank's reserves. The bank's reserves are only 10%, as I said before, of their uh, uh, checkable deposits and demand deposits. So the total here, instead of 1.134 trillion, uh, is around 400 billion. Now if you divide that by the 260 million ounces of gold, the, the price that, that is required is much lower. Um, I think it's in the last chapter of that the Case Against the Fed book. I don't know, it's around $1,500. Yeah, okay, let's say it's $1,500. Okay, fifteen hundred dollars per ounce. But then you'd be le left with a system in which, um, and, and I can't believe that he would be serious about this, or, or wouldn't see that um, uh, people would now notice that that, that, that the Fed w was no longer a lender of last resort. The Fed was liquidated. Uh, there, there was no possibility of creating new reserves. Um, also, of course, we would, we would uh, phase out end federal deposit insurance. So um, I would see bank runs occurring in this system pretty quickly. In other words, the amount of gold would be a 400 billion, and uh, the amount of, of um, instantaneously redeemable uh, liabilities of the banking system were up here around over a trillion. Uh, and it would turn out that uh, you know any sort of uh, an initial shock to the system could very well result, result in a panic that brings about um, a collapse of the system. Okay, so that uh, people will only succeed in, in, in pulling out $400 billion. So we would have a massive deflation. Okay, well maybe that's what Murray's looking forward to. Obviously high price of gold, uh, given current economic uh, uh, relations, and what would happen would be that um, we would get a once and for all inflation of our money supply, okay, as all gold was drawn to the United States. Okay, unless other countries also tied on. But as, gold, as people rushed, think about it, on the market, Gold, they can only get $350 for gold, right? That's the market price. Okay, now if you bring it to the U.S. banking system, you can get $4,000, whatever it is. Okay. The gold's going to flow into the, yes, right. Um, I'm not, I, I don't really care about, I, I don't care if there's a once and for all inflation like that. It doesn't occur through the credit markets. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, uh, uh, distort the interest rate. Um, it's, it's, if inflation ever could be benign, this would be the most benign. Yeah, that's true. I'm not denying any of that. Yes. Yeah, it's going to go, it, it, it could very well go way up. But what I think is that if, as the U.S. progresses towards this system, I think other countries will tie on, the demand for gold will increase, and um, so the, price, the market price will begin to rise uh, towards this price. Um, there's still a lot of thought still has to be devoted to a, some sort of transition plan. But I think it's worth um, devoting that thought to, to, to establishing a money that will potentially become a global currency and a, and a, and a stable um, 
and non-inflatable global currency. I'll stop here and take any questions. We have about five minutes. Yes. Right. 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 I'm not denying that. Yeah. Prices will rise. Prices will rise. If you go back at, 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 at this high, high um, gold price, this go, dollar prices in the world economy will rise as, as the number of... Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's almost a, a change in denomination rather than a true deflation. Okay. You're defining the dollar uh, as, as much less gold than... Um, yeah. You'd have a problem with, with debtors and creditors. Yeah. Um, again, there has to be a lot of thought put, in, put into any, any sort of transition plan at, at such a high gold price. Okay. But I, I think the alternative is um, some sort of a massive deflation. Thanks.